from Byron, Mississippi, it's Lakeshore Church. And now we join Pastor Jay Frazier for today's message. Paul is sharing here, and uh, he, I want to extract out a couple of things that really speak volumes to us about our relationship and our view, uh, our response to other people. Here it is. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy... Make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Pretty tough couple of verses there, a lot of words, but here's what it is. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of of others. You know what's ironic about that? That's exactly opposite of what you hear in the world today. The world you hear, I'm going to get mine. Whatever that looks like, I'm going to get mine. And I'm going to take care of Jay and the rest of it, everybody else is going to be second. And then all of a sudden, the Word of God comes along and we see, wait a second, that's not the way a child of God's supposed to think. And so I want you to consider that today uh, as, we, as we unpackage this together. Let's pray together. We thank you, Lord. You know my heart. I desire for my words to be yours, my thoughts, because I'll go where my thoughts lead me, my thoughts to be yours, and most of all, every one of us, including myself, would operate in obedience to what we hear from you and from the word today, that we would realize the responsibility we have of other people. And God would be careful to give you the praise and the glory for what you do, for we ask it, pray it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Today's a huge one. It, It really is. Um, well, I, we're going to talk about job description. We're going to talk about why we exist, why we breathe even, and it's all about other folks. And I think many times because of our society and because the effect of, of our society and the world that we live in, people are often confused about this and therefore don't get where they need to be. When I think about others, I, I think about it was Cain when the first murder happened in Genesis, first generation or second generation, if you will, Cain killed Abel, his brother. The question was asked, where, where, where's, where's Abel? And Cain said these infamous words, am I my brother's keeper? I've come to tell you today that we are our brother's keeper. We try to get away from that fact, but we are. Hmm. And then we think about this, Andrew, he didn't have a church. He didn't have a doctrine or theology. He didn't have a pastor. He didn't have a missionary. But it was Andrew, when he officially met the Lord, he was already a follower of John the Baptist. But when he officially met the Messiah, the first thing that he did without a pamphlet, without a manual, he didn't even have a Bible. The first thing he did was go get Andrew, his, I mean, uh, Peter, his brother, and, and bring him to the Lord. Then there's the Samaritan woman at the well. We had that scene in the nativity. You heard about the meeting we're having with the leaders afterwards, and that's coming up in December. It'll be here before we know it. I thought about this the other day. It's been so hot and humid, and I sweat like nobody's business. I made the statement the other day, it won't be, but just a few weeks we'll be complaining about how cold it is. I think I'm going to wait a week, though. I really do, as hot as it's been. I'm going to endure a week before I complain. But you know, the Samaritan woman at the well, when she met the Lord, she left her water pot to go tell other folks. Again, she had no directives. Nobody told her what to do. It was a natural response of having met the Messiah was to go tell someone else. Hmm. The the word onus, one of the definitions of it, you might have heard that word in different circles. I know it's of the Lord because I'm not that bright. That word came to mind early in the week. Uh, for this sermon, but onus means responsibility. The onus of others. Who's responsible for others in this Christian faith? And when I think of that, I often wonder, do we, does it really matter how someone lives? In this day and age, I, I really believe somehow or another in theology and doctrine, we've separated the life from the, the outer life from the inner life. We've separated this relationship we have with God and the result that it has on the rest of our being. And today, for your consideration, people are looking, people are watching. Hmm. Does it really matter? And then I think about the burden that we're supposed to have for other people. 1 John 3, 14 says we know that we pass from death unto life because we love the brothers and sisters. That means other people that have been converted, we love them. (laughs) Now, watch this now. The one who does not love remains in death. A direct result, a a direct sign that we've been converted is is something changes. Our love for other people changes even inside the church. I also believe this. No one gets to Jesus by themselves. I I didn't go and do it, but I guarantee you if I told the story here today 
of each one of the ones that were baptized this morning, every one of them would have a story of parents and, and a Sunday school teacher or a pastor or a youth camp or somebody that was praying, maybe a grandmama that was praying them to the cross. No one gets to Jesus by themselves. I don't think we're intellectually capable of doing that. I think we see it from others. Maybe we don't even realize it, but we experience it in other people's lives. I don't know if you're familiar with the name Booker T. Washington. <laughs> I love this, this picture. Booker T., he couldn't make much better a picture than I could. I, that's probably a painting, but there are dozens and dozens of, of his portraits and pictures on, on, uh, uh, on the Internet, and he takes as good a picture as I do. He's a phenomenal educator, phenomenal story. If you're one of those people that likes to re read uh, biographical things and, and autobiographies, stuff like that, people write things, whether it's by themselves or somebody else, he's just phenomenal things in his lifetime. Uh, started universities, affected many, many people. But uh, phenomenal things he said. But he said this, he said, the happiest people are those who do the most for others. The most miserable are those who do the least. God's blessed me through the days to, to interact with a lot of people. That's not a hard for me. I've met some people from time to time, I could, about this many, that, man, they were some of the most wealthiest people I'd been around, and yet had the opportunity to be around them for a day or two and found out not only they're the most wealthiest people, but they're also the most miserable people. And I think sometimes if we don't balance it, we can become so self-absorbed that we miss the very existence that God has for us. And I believe, without exception, I believe that existence is for other people. I believe you and I are supposed to be salt and light. And what does salt and light do? It, it affects that which is around. And I believe people are that that we're supposed to affect. Others, when I think about others of our responsibility, I just want to further some, just some thoughts along these lines of others. Just an insight I think we need and, and enlightenment in the Word of God, what this whole thing's about. When I think about others, I'll give you four things, and I won't stay here long, but listen, just, I, want to, I want to share about the concept. Where did this whole concept of being concerned and caring about other people? Because I'll tell you something, we live in a selfish world, <laughs> you know? I, I mean, you look at it, commercials and everything's driven for self, so I, I got to have it, I want it, and, and a lot of that consumerism is that kind of thing. So, so what is this whole concept? Well, I got to tell you, the concept is, is a God thing. Sin, sin by its nature is selfish. We're sold a bill of goods and we're drawn away, as James said, of our own lust and enticed, and when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. So it's an it's a individual thing, very selfish thing, that I'm going to do this, and I might know that I shouldn't do it, but I'm going to do it anyway, and hopefully God is okay with it. Self-absorbed, it is the origin of sin. Around here, and I know we've got people that maybe have never heard this, so I'm with great vigor I get to share again, but I have been just amazed at the cross itself for decades. That's the reason there's a lot of decor in, in this building and, and where you go and the restroom, different places that have the three crosses on display. Because I know, I know it's not only the place where Jesus paid the sin debt and there were other two people there and so there were three crosses, but I believe in the word of God there's three crosses that are plainly seen for the child of God. These crosses, when I think this whole concept of, of the cross and the vertical and the horizontal that goes with the cross. For you and I to have a relationship with God, you got to have a vertical plank. You with me? you got to have some connection. You have to have connected with Almighty God through Jesus Christ and know him personally. That's the vertical. But I believe with everything about me that the vertical is seen in the horizontal of our life. See, I believe people best see my relationship with Christ, not in the vertical, not in that relationship that I have with God, but the relationship that I have with God that's manifested in the way that I love other people. And I believe the, tragic, the tragedy of this is the church has failed miserably in this arena. Not just Lakeshore Church, but the church as a whole. Somehow we have departmentalized it that you can have a relationship with God and it doesn't affect every other relationship in your life. And I'm telling you, if you trust me at all, I'm telling you, that is a fallacy that's not found in God's word. Amen. I've already shown you a scripture today that says the evidence that I've been to the vertical of the cross is seen in the way that I love others. Wow, so not only is it a concept, I, I believe it's to fight it. I, I believe we fight against it. Not only the concept, but I also think it's very concise. There's a lot of times in church work, people wonder, well, am I doing what God wants me to do? Uh, Rick Warren, uh, you might have heard the, 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 the book, seen the book, read it even, Purpose Driven Life. I mean, churches had studies and guides and all kind of stuff they did with it for several years. Bestseller, New York bestseller, I mean, there's no telling it's millions and millions of copies. I have been sold. I believe the reason it did what it did is because every one of us have something within us where we want to know the purpose of God of our life. I, people, I believe people struggle with that. Am I doing what 
God wants me to do is, is what I'm doing, making a difference. I mean, I, we hear that, we talk it, we, we sense it, we think it a lot. But here's the thing about others. I believe it's our number one job description <laughs> as a child of God. I believe today you and I are obligated to affect someone else for the cause in the kingdom. I believe I failed today that if you came to hear a sermon and it wasn't geared in such a way and prepared in such a way that it exposed Jesus Christ. I believe I failed miserably if somebody encounters me and, and over a period of time, whatever, and there's not a difference in my life versus everyone that somebody that doesn't know the Lord. It's concise. It's our job description. Hmm. One of the greatest statements I've ever heard about this is it, the, the person called it walking slowly through the crowd. Sometimes we need to be reminded, don't we? we? We get all geared up about the work and we're all, we need to be reminded maybe, just maybe that person you work near is the reason God opened the door for you to have that job that you have. Maybe God opened up the, the house that you live in and the neighborhood that you live in and the people that you run with somewhere in the sovereignty of God that God's able to do that. If he's able to spin the world on its axis and it stay there and, and fling the stars in the sky and they stay there, he's able to work out those kind of minutiae things in our life. That God puts people in our life for us to be salt and be light for them. And sometimes we fight the very place that God has for us. And you know, the point is this, is that you ever tasted something that needed salt? Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. You put salt on stuff before you taste it, all right? I'm sorry you feel convicted. You ever been in a dark place and you saw just a little bit of light and how different it made? The world we live in is a very saltless, lightless place. That God needs you and me to make the difference in other people's lives. Very concise. I believe this. I believe it's the number one reward in heaven. I believe when we get to heaven, the number one thing we're going to be rewarded for is not our singing ability. It's not going to be other things in our life. It's not going to be the, the things that we do well and everybody recognizes that we can do this and we can do something with our hands and we can make something. I believe the number one reward in heaven that's going to be handed out is how we affected other people for the cause in the kingdom. I believe it. It's too much word. I almost thought I did this during COVID when we weren't having corporate worship together. We, were, we made a studio. Some of you remember that. And I started then. I would have a page or two of Scripture, if you remember that. I almost did that today. Because when I say there's a lot in the Scripture, sometimes you say, oh, he's just saying that. I feel like somebody said, oh, he's just saying that. There are literally dozens of verses that remind us that our number one job is for other people to see Christ in our life. Our number one job is other people. And I believe it's going to be the biggest reward in heaven. I really do. That's the reason I believe there's equality, because I'm going to tell you something. Anybody can bloom where they're planted. Anybody can be salt and light no matter where they are for Jesus Christ. So it's concise. Let me give you two more. The third one is concern. Now, this is really where this is, gets down. I mean, it's, it's a tough point. My pastor, Lord bless his soul, he's been in heaven for many years now, and I can't wait to see him again one of these days. He poured a lot into me when I need a lot poured into me. He used to make a statement. He said, one of the problems with, with Christian is they get, Christians is they get over being saved. I don't know how old you were. I was saved at a very young age of seven. Now, I was a hagan now. I, I was as bad a sinner as you could be at seven years old. I just want you to know that. He said, preacher, how do you know that? I said, because my mom and daddy told me I was. But anyway. <laughs> but there's a lot of people, probably in the sound of my voice, that have a pretty, you have a pretty rough hell to heaven story. How is it, folks, that we get over being saved? Let me ask it this way when I talk about concern is, how big a burden do you have? When's the last time you shed a tear over somebody that doesn't know the Lord? I think as a church, if we don't watch it, we've gotten real, we, we almost got inoculated to lostness. I got, I got to remind you, and it's not to hurt, but just to tell you the facts, not everybody's going to heaven. And I'm not just saying that on Jay's authority. I'm glad I'm not the doorkeeper. You with me? But I can tell you how you get there. The ones that are going are ones that have the blood of Jesus Christ applied to, to their life. That's the ones going. And what a great day to share this because we saw it today. We saw that God applied it in a, in a way that nobody could see it in the physical. But today they would said in the physical, I know it. And I want the world and the church to know it. I ask every one of them that question. I love that question. Because that's what it's about. But yet I'm concerned, literally, about the concern. <laughs> Today, if people understand what it means to be a believer, do people know what it means to be a believer? Let me ask you this question this way. Maybe some of you have never seen me before. That's okay. Could you take me to the place? 
These folks around here say, I've we've heard, we know where he's fixing to go with this. I can take you to the place of significant things in my life. Hmm. I remember when I saw my wife the first time, she had a bouffant hairdo. I think she got up late. I don't believe she slept on a pillow the night before. She had some hair going on back in the 80s, a long time ago. I remember when my kids were born. You still there? I remember significant things. I remember January the 8th. I remember the rest of my life. Significant things. Sometimes they're not joyous. But listen to me very clearly. Somebody today, on the sound of my voice, whether taking this in through media or you're here today, and you can't articulate a time where you came as a sinner and invited Christ to come into your life, I need to be point blank with you. There's work to be done. Good people don't go to heaven. I don't care what theology you've been embracing. I don't care how bad you see the, Mac, the, God, the, the love of God. Let me tell you something. God's love is unbelievably large, but it's already maxed out. <laughs> There's nothing God can do for us today that would make us realize that he loves us anymore. And there's nothing he could do today to make us realize he loves us any less. You may tell you how I know he maxed out his love? Because he sent his only son to die on a cross for you and me. He maxed it out. Hmm. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. And here's the thought. Listen, concern. Hmm. He did the heavy lifting already. But you and I have to go the way God said to do it. And I want to ask you this deal of concern. How concerned are you, church? When was the last time we pushed away from the table and fasted over somebody's soul? Hmm. I really believe the average church today, we've gotten used to lostness, and we need to be made aware, fresh and new. Concerned. Tomorrow at work, that person that drives you crazy, maybe God's planted you right there to be salt and light to them. Maybe we should turn come, all this issue that we have with them maybe we should turn to concern i don't know anybody i'm not speaking to anybody i'm just saying receive this every one of us the sovereignty of god puts us in places for people to see our relationship with him the concern we should have and the last with this is control mm. i tell you what i in my circle and some of you i know we have a hodgepodge in the room today but you know i grew up and we've been in the congregation Methodist church since i was 10 I heard things like holiness and sanctification and all those kind of spirit-filled life, I, all kind of stuff you hear. And quite honestly, I was a confused young man, very confused as a teenager. When I started digging into the Word and sort of finding out, I, I realized some things that I used to think, okay, if you get sanctified, if you give it to God and, and, and He becomes the Lord of your life, it's like you're going to get this second dose. You're going to come down to the altar and God's going to hit you and knock you and all this kind of stuff. And you hear all this stuff betrayed. And then I find in the Word of God that I control it. If I want to live close to the Lord, it says, I purify myself. He didn't say, be holy and I'll make you holy. He said, be holy like I'm holy. And I don't think that's just a play on words. God's saying, go be holy, Jay, because I'm holy. Now, I'll help you. I will sustain you. I'll empower you. But it's your choice. You control it. And however far you want to go with God, it's your choice. It always has been. God is a God of choice. He set it up that way from the garden to today. But listen to me. We control it. <laughs> I want to show you something. Uh, watch this. Did you? You're going to love this. Evangelism is really like procreation. Let that sink in. So what in the world is the preacher going today? Must not be enough kids in the nursery or something. What's he talking about? Procreation is really like evangelism or evangelism is like procreation. Watch this now. Here it is. Out of us comes others. Huh. I believe it. I believe everything about me. We control it. Listen to me. You know, I, I've, I've gone down this road a lot. Did you know you can't take anything with you? I, I, get, I, I love people that go out there and make a living and all this kind of stuff. And they're going to leave all this stuff to their kids. They're going to blow it. <laughs> Sorry, but that's what research says. We work like something, we just break our back to have something and so that our back can be broken and we can't even enjoy it when we got it. It's amazing how we rip and run after things. Solomon, the most wealthiest man in the world, said all that stuff's just vanity and vexation of spirit. It doesn't mean anything. And, and I believe he was qualified to make that statement. <laughs> but we control it. But evangelism is just like bringing other people in the world, just like Jared and Olivia did with Jace. Here's the thought. Out of us 
my witness, my burden, my prayer life, my concern for others is how people are birthed into the kingdom. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I'll tell you this. That's more the evangelistic pattern and model of the New Testament church than the way we do it today. There's, there's no place in Scripture where there was an altar at the church and the pastor invited people to come down to the altar and find Christ. It's not existent. You know what was happening in the New Testament church? It was like procreation. Evangelism was happening one-on-one because people were concerned and committed to others, and they were finding Christ, and then they were bringing them into the church to be discipled. So it's not, I think it's okay to have an altar. <laughs> the greatest things in my life have happened at an altar in church. But it's about me being responsible for other folks. I'm almost done, but I want to share something really unique. Uh, I want us to look at that word again, onus. I don't know if you've ever used that. You, you, is that part of your term, uh, uh, your vocabulary? It's not mine. I actually knew what it meant when it came to mine in study. Uh, that makes me pretty smart, I guess. And one, uh, one word made me smart. But a lot of other ones make me very dumb. I just want you to know that. But the onus. And I'm sitting in my office early in the week, and this thought came to mind. The responsibility of others. And then it hit me. Onus is really (laughs) on us. Others are our responsibility. Let me tell you what's happening in the church. Everything's specialized now. You you can't hardly find a general physician. Do you know that? Who's your primary care doctor? Most of the time, there's some specialist. You got to go to this specialist. You go see a, you know, there's more nurse practitioners now, it seems like, than general physicians. I mean, it's just crazy how we've specialized everything. I don't want to hurt you. I want to involve you. I want to remind you. Every one of us are ministers. Amen. It's not a day and age where the, the staff or the ministers or the pastors or the missionaries go and win and witness. Every one of us are witnesses. Hmm. The responsibility of others the Word of God says, is on each believer in Jesus Christ. Hmm. It's on us. See, this is, this is the, the thought today. <laughs> First is this, is today is on me. Today's on me. With where we sit and stand today, it's on me. And I want you to receive this. Today, I've failed if you don't come face to face with Jesus Christ. Every one of us need him. One day I'm going to stand in front of the Lord and he's going to welcome me into eternity not because of what Jay's done, not because of being a parent, not because of being a a, a husband, not because of being a great guy in society, not even being a pastor. I'm going to heaven because I've trusted Christ and his blood's been applied. Hmm, His blood is on me. But what's on me to do for you today is remind you that's where it starts. And I hope and trust that you know him. But if not, today is the day to get to know him. Amen. Amen. We've celebrated with eight. Today is the day of salvation. That's on me. Hmm. If you don't know him, I'd love to see you. I want to put you out in in a public way this way. But listen, you shouldn't leave this room today if you doubt that. That's what it's all about. When it's all said and done, all that's going to matter is what's said and done with Jesus Christ. That's on me. But listen to me, folks. In a few minutes, we're going to go. Listen to me. How far would you have to go? This is the most matter-of-fact, cut-dry thing you'll ever hear me say to you. How far would you have to go in your circle before you'd be concerned about where somebody stands with the Lord? How far? I wonder if there's a spouse on the sound of my voice or on Facebook that today you'd be concerned. They might clean up well, but you don't see new birth in their life. You haven't seen that. Where's that care for others and those types of things that the Word of God says, that you're a new creature in Christ, the old's passed away? How far would you have to go? Would there be a mom and dad on the sound of my voice that you'd be scared to death today to think about the rapture of the church happening or this building falling in and something was to happen to somebody that you brought in this world? You'd be concerned for their soul. See, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about onus. That's when I talk about owning it. That's when I talk about responsibility. See, far too many times, we might have been sold a bill of goods that we think everybody's going, but that's not what the Word of God says. We think everybody's good enough. That's not what the Word of God says. I'm not even good enough to go to heaven, except that the blood's been applied. Are you following what I'm saying? Hmm? See, here's where we're going to end. It's on us. How far would you have to go? 
How far would you have to, the old hymn says, how far would you have to go before the circle would be broken? When we get over there to heaven, how big's the circle going to be before it's broken? That's what that hymn says. That's what we're talking about today. And I just believe where God's been pulling on my heartstrings is this. Jay, walk slowly through the crowd. I've caught myself that you got so much stuff to do and you do, but sometimes we need to be reminded that sometimes we walk by people that are our ministry. <laughs> That's what our day is about. It's about walking slowly through the crowd. It's about having a kind word and a smiling face. It's about impacting someone else for the cause of the kingdom. Not getting caught up in my little world and think everybody else should understand my world. No, my world is really supposed to be your world. Is that a great lesson? Mm -hmm. Do I need to hear it on a regular basis? Yes. God help me walk slowly through the crowd. How far would you have to go? And I'll leave it with you here. Leave it here. If there's somebody that comes to mind, take the opportunity. You'd never know. you never know. I can recount at least a dozen of people that I sought the opportunity. Sometimes my heart was beating. I knew I was supposed to. But other times it just came to mind. I said, I want to ask you about your relationship with the Lord. I'd have people say, I want to talk to you about that. And find out that God had been working with them the whole time. And they were trying to figure out a way to get to the cross that didn't know how. There are people in our lives every day that do not know the Jesus that you know. And I believe within me... <laughs> If we live it in front of them as salt and light, there will be a thirst, there will be a desire to see that. The responsibility of others is on us. Every one of us. And so today, here we are. We're, we're, we're fixing to pray. But I ask this question. Because it's my responsibility as a minister of the gospel, do you know him? <laughs> that onus is on me. Because this is what authority God's given me in this place. And I don't say as authority looking at me. I'm talking about my responsibility. As a pastor, as a preacher, do you know him? Today's a great day to get to know him. It's simple. You invite him to come into your life. You've seen it. I, 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 I heard witness of it again and again leading up to these baptisms. But then the other thing, folks, is this. Just remember, wherever you go, whatever your day holds, I believe a sovereign God puts people in our path that are those other folks that need to see the difference that Christ makes in a life. And if there's ever been a day that that needs to happen, it's today, no doubt about it. All right? If you're able, will you stand with us today? Everybody, bow, would you just bow your head right here in the house of the Lord today? Lord, you know what these basics have meant to me. Just do the basics. Just, just, if you just operate in the basics, we will be... We invite you to visit lakeshorecmc.org to find out more online. That's lakeshorecmc.org.